Hello everybody and welcome to our research presentation, Results of the Avery's Rest Bioarchaeological Investigations. This research presentation is being brought to you by the Delaware Historical and Cultural Affairs, so thank you very much for having me on today. My name is Raquel Fleskis. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania studying the colonial time period using DNA methods. I use DNA to try to characterize ancestry and relationships in archaeological populations. So I'm really excited to be here today to share with you some of the initial results that we have found during our pilot study of the Avery's Rest site. And this site is really important in helping us understand who was here in the 17th century on the Delaware's frontier how people are related to each other, and what were relationships like on the early frontier. So before we begin, I really want to acknowledge that the results I'm going to be discussing today are the byproduct of many scientists and archaeologists at the University of Pennsylvania, such as my advisor, Dr. Theodore Shore, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with Dr. Graciela Cabana, and Dr. Frankie West, who helped with the DNA analyses of this by letting us use their ancient DNA lab, which we'll talk about in a little bit in this presentation. And also importantly, the Delaware Archaeological Society, who with a suite of amazing volunteers excavated the remains. And most importantly, the Smithsonian Institution with the Owsley team, who helped to characterize the osteology of the site, which has been really important in trying to understand the lived experience. So moving forward, this results of these research project is not only my own work, but work from so many other team members. Um, so just want to show our gratitude for them today. So today we're going to uh, go through a couple of sections. Should probably take about 45 minutes to an hour to get through. So we've gone through our introductions. We'll talk about the background of the 17th century and also the background of the Avery's rest site and why it's important. We'll then go through our study questions, so what our research hypotheses were. What were the types of things we were looking for and hoping to answer? Then we're going to go through and look at the osteology of the site and also the genetics of the site. So we're going to go through both the methods, so I want you guys to understand how we looked at things, why we came to the conclusions, and why are they important. For both the osteology and genetics, we're going to go through the methods and the results. And then we're going to talk about future directions. This is the first step in understanding really the lived experiences on the 17th century Chesapeake frontier. And there's a lot more to learn. So we'll definitely be back here for another presentation soon. So to begin, the Chesapeake colonies of Maryland, Virginia, and present-day Delaware represent an early foci of European colonization in North America by England in the 17th century. We know that conditions in England were poor, with few job opportunities and low wages, and many turned to the North American colonies in search for better opportunities. The Chesapeake colonies are known for their notoriously high death rate, though, due to large, harsh living conditions and what's called the seasoning sickness, um, which has led to a high death rate as shown here. In addition, the Chesapeake is also known for having a very imbalanced sex ratio. There's as much as three men for every one woman in the colonies. So this has led to a majority of historians to think about the organization of lifeways on the frontier, or, you know, what was life like um, as being primarily non-kinship based or non-family based. And yet when we look deep into the records of headright records, we actually see that kinship might have been an organizing principle in settling the frontier, right? So headright head records look at settlement patterns. So we really wanted to ask the question, did biological kinship affect migration and settlement patterns for free migrants? Also important part of the story includes the African diaspora in the 17th century Chesapeake. So after economic conditions improved in England, English indentured labor dropped dramatically, which was supplying a lot of the labor in this early kind of 17th century context. And instead, enslaved African labor began to be brought into the Chesapeake to work on these tobacco plantations. 
Unfortunately, most records, if any, that we have of these individuals come from ship inventories, which provide usually little no to no identifying information on the individual's identities, their names, who they were, where they came from. Thus, it became, becomes almost impossible to reconstruct who and where these enslaved Africans came from using traditional historical methods. For the 17th century Chesapeake, it is not known where most African uh, where African individuals were originated from. The presence of enslaved Africans is still relatively rare in the 17th century Chesapeake, leading to questions about the relationships between enslaved African and European individuals and the origins of those enslaved persons. We also know that indentured servants labored alongside enslaved Africans on tobacco plantations and were often buried in close proximity to European persons, suggesting a different experience of labor relationships in this early, early period, frontier period, compared to later periods in the 18th and 19th century when we see more entrenched, racialized, codified labor laws representing enslavement that we are familiar with today. So we wanted to ask the question, where did enslaved persons originate in, in peripheral locations of the Chesapeake? We really don't know, such as in Delaware, where we have less than 500 individuals estimated to be there by 1700. We also wanted to understand what were relationships like in these early frontier places like Avery's Rest? What were the relationships like between European individuals and enslaved Africans? So the archeological site of Avery's Rest offers a really unique perspective to begin to answer and probe into these questions. Avery's Rest is a 17th century archeological site located near present day Lewis, Delaware. So this is a little bit outside of Rehoboth Beach. So site scatter was originally identified in 1976, but a full excavation of the site by Dan Griffith and his team um, from the Archeological Society of Delaware did not begin till 2006. Over several years of excavation with tons of volunteer help, many archaeological features have been identified, helping us understand life ways on the 17th century Chesapeake frontier. Excavations have revealed refuse pits, which you can see here in these red circles, um, containing household debris. We see structural posts, so that forms basically two structures we can see on the site here, outlined in red. We also see the appearance of two cellars circled here in black, um, which probably functioned as a storehouse for crops, meat, or farming tools, as well as two fenced ditches. So here is probably a fenced compound here, then as well as a fenced compound here. This, along with the documentary evidence and archaeological evidence that we won't have time to or unfortunately to get in today, dates the site to around 80, 1680s, to around the 1710s. And we think that there might have been two occupations of the site related to the Avery family. And really important is that 11 burials were also uncovered and excavated. And this happened in 2014. The burials were positioned into two clusters. So you can see here we have a southern burial cluster of eight individuals and a northern burial cluster of three individuals. So this is where we come in. So with this study background in mind, bioarchaeological methods were applied to the skeletal series to understand who these people were and where did they came, come from? How did they relate to each other? In 2014, Dr. Doug Owsley and his team at the Smithsonian Institution undertook osteological analyses of these individuals to understand demographics, okay, such as sex, age, and ancestry as well as life ways, so experiences that occurred over the individual's lifetime that have been recorded in the boat. Um, in 2016, I was brought in to undertake the genetic analyses of these individuals. Genetics, which we're going to talk about a little bit in more detail later on in this presentation, allows us to characterize biological kinship, right? So how you related to each other, and ancestry, or where you come from in archaeological persons. So this is me here in the University of Tennessee Knoxville's ancient DNA lab. In order to undertake these genetic analyses that we'll talk about in more detail later on, 
you have to be properly suited up from head to toe to ensure that there's no contamination going from me to the sample, right? So this is just a photograph of showing the kinds of uh, laboratory wear that we have to wear in order to undertake these analyses. So using these methods of osteology and genetics, we wanted to answer the following study questions. Who was buried at Avery's Rest? Where did they come from? What were their relationships like? And how does this inform lifeways on the 17th century Delaware frontier? So now we're going to get into the methods of these sites. Osteological methods provides a powerful tool to understand basic demographics like sex, age, and ancestry, as well as to discern experience of archeological persons found in burial settings. So the skeletal bi biology of biological males and females differs slightly, and we can use this information to discern things like age, sex, and ancestry. For instance, the curvature of the eye orbits and the shape of the skull can differ between a biological male and a biological female. Females tend to be a little bit more gracile in the skulls than males do. So in that way, we can tell sex. And our skeletal biology often changes with our age, right? So our adult teeth come in, you know, our sutures on top of our head, which, you know, uh, you know, tend to kind of come together more, fusing. In addition, different populations tend to have slightly different looking crania. And this is a byproduct of genetic variation and geological distribution in the course of our human evolution, right? So this is a byproduct of natural small scale population differentiation based off migration patterns. And we can use the slight differences in skull morphology to try to assess geographical origins of archaeological individuals. But it's also really important to point out that this all exists on a spectrum, right? So it's not definitive. But this is what the beauty is in combining osteology with genetics, is that we can kind of inform a more robust estimation of age and sex that we wouldn't be able to do independent of each other. So at Avery's Rest, we use these methods to identify sex at the, uh, uh, between the 11 burials found at Avery's Rest. We identified that there were two females at the site. You can see here with our little biological female uh, symbol and where they're located in the burial. So each one of these blue spheres is a burial and each one of those numbers represents the burial number of that individual. So burials six and seven were both identified as female and you'll notice they both are found within this southern burial cluster. Now we also identified two children at the site. One of them is an infant. You can see here burial number two, also found in this southern burial cluster. And then we also found evidence of a child age about five to six years old. This individual was found in our northern burial cluster. And the reason why we can identify um, different ages and bones based on overall skeletal development and kind of tooth eruption schedule. So we were able to use those two pieces of information to date the ages of these two children found at Avery's Rest. And, and it's not pictured here, but all the rest of the individuals are male and are probably around adult age. Now, importantly, demographics were also able to estimate that the eight European individuals found in the southern group belonged to a European, had a European cranial facial morphology, whereas the three individuals in this northern group had an African morphological appearance, okay? So what does that mean? Is that the skulls of the eight individuals in the southern burial cluster looked more like European populations. So they had kind of a more narrow face, more angular in the jaw. Um, African individuals, they tend to be a little bit wider in the jaw, have a little bit of a larger nose orbital. Um, and so these uh, different signifiers in the cranium led the scientists at the Smithsonian Institution to believe that I think we have three African individuals in the north, 
and eight European individuals in the South. And this brings up questions about, wow, they're buried separate, right? But also not that separate, very close together. We can see here the difference, the distance between individual eight and individual 11 is less than 10 feet. So they're buried within the same burial grounds, but separated. So we also wanted to peer into this to understand, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of lived experience and life ways? So another way that osteology can help us understand lived experience is by looking at different signifiers in the bone to say, wow, this bone has been worn in such a specific way that has had to be happened due to an individual's habit over time. So this is AR10. This is an adult African male. You can see here this beautiful curvature in the teeth. This comes from habitually smoking a tobacco pipe. So clay tobacco pipes are very, very granular. Um, and over time, they can generate big holes for wear. So this is where this individual would habitually place his tobacco pipe to smoke. You can kind of see right over here, there's actually another hole here. So he had two holes in his teeth. So we know that, and there were a couple of other individuals that also had evidence of smoking tobacco. Now, if anyone knows anything about the 17th century Chesapeake region, it is a tobacco focused um, colony, right? So it was not uncommon for people to be habitually smoking tobacco all the time when they're out um, working during the day, both European and African individuals. In addition, we can look for signs of wear on the bones. So this, these are pictures of vertebrae, okay? So this is your spinal column. So here in these holes in the center is where your spinal cord will go through, and these large pieces right here is kind of where your discs would be. So these would be stacked upon each other with a little jelly disc in between. Now, if you look really closely right where my arrow is, you can see that there are these little divots in the bone, right? These are what are called Schmorl's nodes. Schmorl's nodes occur from a ton of axial compression or compression coming down from the top. So you're carrying a lot of heavy things, right? So we find evidence of Schmorl's nodes on most of the adult individuals found at Avery's Rest, both of African descent and of European descent. Um, not pictured here. We also see that the bones are just so crazy robust, right? So there is a older woman at Avery's Rest, and oh my gosh, you would just think that she is an adult male because her bones are so robust. And that happens when you have a lot of muscle activation. You're using your muscles all the time, so that tension from that muscle pulling on the bone makes the bone thicker. Right, so when you have more robust, robust bones, you have larger muscle mass. So they all had a lot of muscle mass at Avery's Rest. So this suggests that a lot, everybody um, in who was buried at Avery's Rest was doing a lot of hard labor. Now, why is this not that surprising? Well, think about it. We are in Delaware in the 1680s, 1690s, there is not a lot, there are not a lot of people on the Delaware frontier at this point, okay? You are lucky if your neighbor is close by you. It is a pretty empty place in terms of European colonization. Now, of course, there are indigenous people around, um, but really it's a pretty sparse out place. Um, the Avery family did have enslaved labor on their site, but also we know that this is not the antebellum period in the South where we see a separation of European and African individuals in a codified racialized hierarchy, okay? Everybody is working on this field, right? Because everybody has to eat and get fed, okay? It is a tough, tough life. Now, <clears throat> what we cannot tell from the bone is the allocation of labor. And this is really, really important. So we can't tell who is assigned to do the tough labor and who is assigned to do the easier labor. And was that assigned based on race and enslavement status? And where was that based on sex? And how does power interact and interplay 
within these dynamics, okay? So our osteology, as much as it is very, very informative in helping us understand life ways, it also is limited because it's letting us view from a very specific vantage point, which sometimes does not represent the total sociocultural experience at the time that these pe persons lived, that person was alive. Now, what it can tell us though, is if there is any trauma present on these individuals. This is AR10. This is, again, our adult African male found in our northern burial cluster. Now, he is the only individual with any sort of what is called perimortem trauma. Perimortem trauma occurs at the time of death or shortly thereafter. And we look at this by trying to be able to assess um, the color of the breaks of the bone to determine, well, if the color is the same, the outside versus the inside of the fracture, then they are aging and weathering at the same time. Now, let's say this individual broke their, this is their cheekbone, their maxillary, their zygomatic. Um, if that broke off uh, after the person died, then it would have a slightly different color wear pattern variation. So that being said, we're learning a little bit about taphonomy in this presentation. This individual, AR10, has the only evidence of any sort of trauma happening at the time of death. The zygomatic process, which is your cheekbone, has disconnected. You can see here with the two arrows pointing at the bone. Now this is also called a boxer's fracture. This occurs from acute blunt force trauma to the face that would detach right, that cheekbone, or from a fall that directly at a kind of a blunt fall where the force of the fall would be on the cheek. Now we know that this trauma occurred at or near the time of death, but we don't know exactly what happened. And that is further compounded by the fact that we have very little documentary evidence on the identities of these African individuals found at Avery's Rest. Um, the only document that we have that talks about them um, actually just talks about them in the um, context of being evaluated in a property evaluation, right? So they're not even being talked about as individuals with lives, with family, um, but they're talked about as uh, an economic piece of property. So it is very, very difficult to really understand the point of view of this person. We can really just use the osteology to say, okay, something happened at this point of, in period. It is interesting because we know that this individual died um, around the same time as the other individual. So we don't know the circumstances surrounding this individual's death, but we think something might be going on. So there has been an archivist that has been hired by um, uh, Delaware uh, Historical Society, um, who is going to be looking kind of into the documents behind the Avery occupation and trying to identify these African remains. So the mystery is still left to be solved. Okay, so now we're going to shift into understanding the genetics. So we've just talked about the osteological results and how it's been able to help us understand demographics, sex, age, lived experience, cause of death. Now we're going to shift into talking about genetics, which is what I do, where we can try to look at questions about biological kinship. So, you know, we see so children at the site, right? Are they related to anybody? and also ancestry. So osteology has identified that there are African or African descended remains at the site. Is that also reflected in the genetics? So, and we can also look more specifically at where in Africa or where in Europe these individuals were found. So in order to do this, um, we, I, here the top photo is the picture of my home institution, University of Pennsylvania. We collaborated with the University of Tennessee to undertake these analyses. And that's because the University of Tennessee has a special ancient DNA lab. And the ancient DNA lab is also called a clean lab. So you can see this image right here. You can see there's the suits that I was wearing in that initial photo from a couple slides ago. So this clean lab is essentially a DNA free lab. And that's really important because we want to make sure that the DNA I'm extracting from the bone is not the DNA that's coming from myself, right? So we have to do the full suit up. 
these clean labs you're not allowed to enter unless you're fully dressed up and everything is clean. So you're doing a lot of cleaning with bleach and ethanol while you're in there. Now, University of Tennessee also has a beautiful modern lab here, too, so you, you can enter into this uh, room freely, uh, not having to have to suit up all the time. Unfortunately, you do have to take proper precautions when working with any sort of biological material. But here we do a lot of our amplification and preparing the DNA samples for sequencing. So where do you get DNA from? Okay, right? So we have these fancy labs. I talked to you about these suits, you know, but you know, where, what samples are we using? Um, well, you can get DNA from a lot of different things, actually. You can get it from bone, right? So you can also get it from teeth. Not the hard enamel part, but actually the tooth roots are rich in DNA. Um, and you can also get it from hair if it's survivable. This is more kind of dependent on forensic context. And for us, we really are focusing on bone and teeth because they contain the highest percentage of endogenous DNA. When I mean endogenous, I mean DNA that belongs to you, okay? Now, in order to get at the DNA, you have to go through multiple steps. So we target specifically what is called the petrous bone. Petrous bone is actually your inner ear bones, not the specific little inner ear bones, but the bone surrounding and protecting your ear canal. It contains some of the densest bone in the human body. So to be able to extract DNA, you really want to go for the hardest, hardest part of the body that contains the best DNA preservation. So in order to get to that, what we would do is um, suit up, go into our lab suites, and we go into our bone clone zone to further prevent any DNA contamination. Then we kind of chip away all parts of the bone that are not this hard, hard, dense part here until you're left with this kind of, it almost looks a little bit like an octopus in a way. And we do that using a Dremel handheld tool. Next, we bleach the bone and we put it through what is called a UV crosslinker. This is a microwave type looking machine which basically blasts it with UV rays that prevent any sort of amplification or it prevents any sort of contamination that could potentially be on the bone from kind of over amplifying and drowning out the signal from our archaeological DNA, right? So we take our bleached bone that's all clean, we take all the any DNA that does not belong to the bone off of it, then what we do is we grind it up into small frag to small kind of fragments and powder. And we do that using liquid nitrogen. So this is our freezer mill machine. It's really exciting because what it does is that it uses liquid nitrogen to make that bone super, super, super cold. And then we take a magnet and it goes back and forth a ton of times very, very, very fast. And it pulverizes the bone into a powder. And once you get this powder, you're ready to extract the DNA. Except for the fact that, you know, we're in that DNA, in that powder, you have a lot of stuff in it, right? So it can be the DNA of the individual, the archaeological individual. It can be, hopefully not, but maybe your DNA if you're not careful. It can be DNA of microbes or fungus that could be in the bone. So what we have to do then is isolate all the other stuff that's possibly in this DNA extract so we can just sequence the DNA. And how we do this is with this, what is called a spin column technique. So here is our little tube of our DNAs and there's all the bunch of junk that we don't need into it. What we do is then we stick the solution into the spin column. So the spin column here is this little insert, right? That has a silica membrane. And we're getting into the science right now because I'm excited to talk about this. But that means that the DNA gets stuck to the, all the little silicone molecules. So it keeps the DNA out. But everything else that we don't want, the junk gets washed out, all the proteins, things that we don't need. And eventually you're left with a kind of only DNA present in the solution. Okay? So what we want to do then for this study specifically is look at a specific type of DNA called mitochondrial DNA. We specifically target and targeted and sequence that DNA. So mitochondrial DNA, now you guys are gonna get a little bit of a genetics primer, okay? A little bit of a genetics lesson. Mitochondrial DNA is a type of DNA that you get 
only from your mother. So we can see here in this image here, it reflects your direct maternal ancestry. And that makes it a really powerful tool to look at maternal history because that you know that you get your mitochondrial DNA from your mother, she gets hers from her mother and so on and so forth. And the reason why that happens is because mitochondrial DNA is DNA found in the mitochondria of the cell, okay? So it's different from our nuclear DNA. Our nuclear DNA is also referred to as our whole genome, okay? This is our 23 chromosomes that you get some from your mom and some from your dad and they mix it up. 3.2 billion base pairs, the whole ordeal. Mitochondrial DNA is different from our nuclear DNA in that it's found only in the mitochondria. It is much, much, much smaller, so it's only the 16,000 base pairs. And it's also this circular kind of structure instead of our kind of our chromosomal structure, okay? So what we did is we wanted to look at mitochondrial DNA and sequence this specific region called the hypervariable region of that mitochondrial DNA. And what this was going to do for us is help us to understand what the maternal ancestries of these individuals were and how they're related to each other. And this is a really great step to do when you're doing pilot research like this study was, because you wanted to know in the first place, is there even any DNA that you can extract from these, from these archeological bones? Because sometimes there just is not. Um, due to bad preservation, preservation. So before we did any deeper or more expensive analyses later on, we needed to show proof of concept. So we did mitochondrial DNA sequencing to be able to show, yes, there is intact DNA, and this is these cool results that we found with it. So how do we use mitochondrial DNA to help us understand things like biological kinship and ancestry? Well, one way we can do this is by studying the mutations present in our mitochondrial DNA. And what we do then is match them with the mutations found across the globe. And the reason why we can do this is that because the accumulation of mutations allows inferences about timing and direction of population dispersals. Now, what does that mean? Well, that goes back to understanding our human evolutionary history, okay? We know that modern humans evolved in Africa. We were in Africa for a very, very long time. And the more time, the more mutations accumulate, right? And these mutations are not things like X-Men, you know, uh, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. These are small, random changes in the DNA that usually don't have any effects. They're just a byproduct of change over time. So when we say that the genetic diversity in African populations is very high, we're talking that African populations have a lot of these not these random mutations that really don't do anything, right? It's just a marker of change over time. So for instance, in this diagram here, we have their continent of Africa, and Africa has a lot of different colored marbles, right? Those different colored marbles are a subset in South Africa, South American populations, right? And that is due to our shared migration history, okay? So the distribution of mutations across the globe is a reflection of our shared evolutionary migration history out of Africa. Super exciting and cool. So if you can see here, you know, when populations left Africa, you know, 100, 200,000 years ago, only a subpop, only one part of the population left, okay? And a lot of people stayed in Africa. Um, and we had a population going into the Near East, which represents in this diagram only a subset of the genetic diversity found in Africa, right? And then those populations then went into Europe or went into Asia. And with that, losing different colored marbles along the way, right? So they are kind of representing a subset of this genetic variation. So the populations in Australia, for example, look different in their population diversity and those accumulation of different colored marbles than that in Africa, which represents the kind of totality of genetic diversity or these mutations in human history, okay? So what we then do now is take those 
different colored marbles, that assemblages of these different mutations, and we call them into groups. Now this may look confusing, but if you look at, see the patterns of the arrows are slightly the same. And that's because it's reflecting the same evolutionary history. All those different colored marbles found in Africa are now represented by these haplogroups. So haplogroups is the type of names that are used to classify these mutations. So a haplogroup represents a series of mutation, a series of these random markers found in that individual. So an L1 haplogroup has a different set of markers than let's say a B haplogroup, right? Which would contain a subset of these markers from Africa. This is a lot of genetic theory, but I always wanted to communicate this to you guys because I want you guys to be able to understand how and why we come to these conclusions. And I'd be happy to revisit this um, at any time if you have any questions about it. So now to get to the juicy details, what were our genetic results? Our mitochondrial DNA testing results? What we found here are each of the images of the burials. You can see we have remarkable preservation at, of the Avery's Rest uh, site, just incredible for the Chesapeake region. And we have here the sample number. So these are the burial numbers. Okay, so one through eight, if you remember, we'll show an image um, on the next slide. They're in the southern group of thought to be European individuals and 9, 10, and 11 are in the northern group of what is thought to be African individuals. Now what stands out at us when we look at this is that we see that there are four individuals that share this H1AF, right? All the rest of the individuals have different haplogroups. So these are all of our mitochondrial haplogroups. So right, so an L3E3 represents all the mutations for that group whereas the H1AF is gonna have the same as another individual with an H1AF, okay? So we see a diversity of different results, right? That, and we'll talk about in, in kind of how that aligns then also with uh, ancestry and, uh, and origins. So when we overlay this H1AF, right? So going back to that H1AF as being a marker, of, oh my gosh, four individuals at the site contain the same mitochondrial motif, what does that mean? When we overlay that with age and sex information, we see the H1AF represented by this red signifier is found with two females and then one child and potentially one male, but we may want to be questioning this one because it's a little bit interesting um, because it is a male. So. When we look at this, this may be a signifier of biological kinship, okay? So when you have the same mitochondrial DNA sequence, it means that people share direct maternal ancestry, right? So we go back to that initial slide a couple, uh, a couple of slides ago that showed that your mitochondrial DNA is inherited from your mother and inherited to, from your her mother there is a direct maternal linkage. H1AF is a relatively rare lineage in European populations today, reported at very, very low frequencies. Now to have four individuals with the same H1AF mitochondrial DNA control region signature is pretty rare. And it's also to, just also to say that these DNA extractions were conducted at different times, so it's not a contamination issue, okay? So this suggests that the people with H1AF share direct maternal ancestry. But you can see that this is only found within the European individuals here. So when we look at the distribution of haplotypes, of mitochondrial DNA haplotypes, we see the H1AF is located only within the European individuals. And the African individuals contain different haplogroups. L3E3, L0A1A, and L3I2, these letters and numbers don't match. This indicates that there is no direct maternal ancestry between the African or African descendant individuals found at Avery's Rest, but that we do see direct maternal ancestry in the European individuals. Now to me, this indicates a privileging of biological relationships in burial contexts. 
between Europeans and African individuals. The fact that we see a child, AR11, as a five to six year old child and is not buried with their mother or in the context of their mother um, says to me, you know, what is, is, how is this representative of the violence inflicted in enslavements, right? Um, this to me is a symbolic representation of that structural violence that accompanies enslavement in the colonial period. Now that doesn't mean that they're not related to each other paternally or through the father's side. And that's something that we're going to be looking into more when we do our whole genome. We can look at the Y chromosome, right, which shows us paternal or male relatedness. So there is a chance that there is a father-son relationship or father-daughter, father-child relationship between the African individuals or a brother or an uncle situation going on. And we also on the same on the flip side with the European individual will be able to probe into seeing is there any paternal relatedness between any of these European individuals. We think likely there will be because there is this maternal signature, right? Especially with the infant there. Potentially, they will be able to see some biparental male relatedness within the European individuals, which would signify kinship at the site. Okay. So genetics also helps us look at ancestry. So we already talked more broadly that the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups show that there was a European, all the European mitochondrial DNA haplogroups were found in the southern burial cluster and the African haplogroups were found in the northern cluster, okay? And that also aligns with the osteology of the site that said that there were African individuals in this northern cluster here and European individuals in the southern cluster, okay? Now, what we can do though is we could take that a step further. We can look and see where in Africa did these individuals originate from? Now, the reason why we can ask this question is because it goes back to, again, our genetics theory, our genetics primer. Africa is an extremely diverse continent. It is a giant continent, and people have been living on that continent for hundreds of thousands of years, and the more time, the more accumulation of those marbles, so or more accumulation of those mutations, right? So populations in South Africa look slightly different than populations in Northern Africa. So we wanted to see where in Africa are these mitochondrial DNA haplotypes found, right? So what we did is we assessed over 17,000 persons with published MT mitochondrial DNA across the continent of Africa to look at frequency, right? So where were each of these haplogroups found? We found some pretty interesting results. So number nine is here. We can see kind of anywhere where these kind of darker signatures are is the frequency of where the higher frequency of where this L0A1A is found. And same thing with L3E. Now L0A1A, you can see it's dark kind of around the coast of Africa and also in Southern Africa too. And so also we see populations here, but mostly it's focused primarily around here. And the same thing with L3E3 is kind of this central Southern African focus a little bit in the West in West and Central Africa here. Now, the reason why it gets a little bit fuzzy with these haplogroups is that also there's been a lot of migration in Africa since, you know, uh, individuals uh, left Africa, right? So people have been moving around and they've been sharing and spreading their mitochondrial haplogroups. And then we also had a huge population displacement, forced population displacement because of the transatlantic slave trade. So it becomes a little bit more difficult to piece together the exact regions of ancestry, other than the fact that we know that they're primarily for L3E3, for AR10, probably most likely coming from central southern Africa, and L0A1A kind of from the same area here. Now, L3I was a really interesting case because it's a very rare haplogroup, and it's only actually reported in the Horn of Africa, right? So in East Africa. So this led us to think about, okay, well, what is a child with East African ancestry doing in 17th century Delaware? Now this can lead us to different conclusions, right? Well, do we have any records about the involvement of East Africa and the transatlantic slave trade? Very, very minimally, 
If it did happen, it came through the Portuguese, through kind of Mozambique area, and then it, they went to uh, uh, Brazil, and then they would have had to go from Brazil to the Chesapeake. And the Chesapeake during this time period is such a minor, minor location in the transatlantic slave trade. The le- probability of this happening is likely not true, um, likely not viable. Another explanation for this is that we see an individual with a parentage with East African ancestry because there was just transcontinental migration. So somebody from East Africa moved to West Africa, right? Migrated. There we know that there are transcontinental uh, trading routes, right? Um, so that's a possibility. Or it could be that L3I is distributed way more than we think it is. Um, Africa, because even though we have a lot of samples, it is such a big con- continent, it is vastly undersampled because of a very European focus on DNA studies that has historically been occurring. So we really don't know too much about African diversity and we should know a lot more. Now the fourth reason why we could see L3I here and we're going into all the nuances, is that because we're just looking specifically at the control region of the mitochondrial DNA. And that is a representation not of the entire mitochondrial genome, okay? There could be mutations or those little random markers that lay outside of the region that we sequenced, which would change this classification, okay? So this is something that we're going to be probing into, but what we do know is that largely we have a West Central African focused haplogroup distribution at Avery's Rest, and they're not related to each other maternally. So in summary, what did we find? We found that African and European individuals were buried at Avery's Rest. We know that the African and European individuals were buried close together, but they were separated, okay? So what does this say then about labor and relationships in this, these individuals' life? Patterns of wear suggest that heavy labor was subject for all individuals, but we cannot determine the specific activities that may have been influenced by the social cultural norms of enslavement at this time in the 17th century. The African individuals have diverse maternal ancestries coming from across the continent, which helps us understand these early patterns of the transatlantic slave trade, right? And maternal relationships were present between the European individuals, as we can see here with the H1AF, but not in the African individuals, which helps us think about or shows us what, you know, the privileging of biological kinship in burial ground settings. And lastly, a very important takeaway is that enslavement was an active determinant of life ways at Avery's Rest. We know that there is a power imbalance which may or may not have contributed to the trauma present in AR-10 at the time of his death. So if you want to read more about our work, we have an article published in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology entitled Ancient DNA and Bioarchaeological Perspectives on European and African Diversity and Relationships on the Colonial Delaware Frontier. So you're more than welcome to check that out. And we also have a write-up in Forbes magazine which kind of discusses the summary of the article. So we can link that to the end of the video. Um, But we're not done, right? So like I said before, this was just the first part, the first step of our research, right? So what we're going to be doing now is looking at the whole genomes of these individuals. So we want to look more specifically at ancestry, target that. Is that really East African individual? Is that person really East African? Or is that just a byproduct of our previous methodological framework? Where in Africa are these individuals coming from? We also want to look and see the extent of kinship. We want to look at non-maternal kinship, right? That paternal, the male relationships, and also the biparental ancestry. So, you know, are there, uh, you know, aunts and uncles present at this site? And we also want to try to identify the European individuals at the site. We want to integrate genealogical evidence and genomic evidence and osteological evidence to be able to try to name who the European individuals were. And we're able to do that because we have really good documents on who was likely found at Avery's Rest for the European individuals. And we're hoping we can uncover more documents to try to find out more information about the African individuals found at Avery's Rest.
So with that, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching this presentation. I hope you guys learned a lot about Avery's Rest and the work that we're doing at the site. Learned a little bit about genetics and a little bit about osteology. I want to thank all of our collaborators, the Archaeological Society of Delaware, Smithsonian Institution, University of Pennsylvania, University of Tennessee, as well as our funding sponsors, National Geographic and NSF, the National Science Foundation. Most importantly, I want to thank the Avery's Rest community, the property owners, that allowed archaeological excavations to happen at Avery's Rest um, and anybody who really follows this research closely. And most importantly, also the Delaware Historical and Cultural Affairs for inviting me to do this presentation today. Thank you guys so much.